Clinton Street Theater in Southeast Portland has been around for like over 100 years, surviving through its many owners and transitions in programming. And last year, it was bought yet again, but this time collectively by seven film fanatics, which included former employees and volunteers at the theater. It's something pretty special that feels like it could only happen in our city. So today on CityCast Portland, we're talking with Susan Tomorrow and Aaron Coulter, two of the new proprietors, to check in on how it's going as they come up on their one-year anniversary of running one of the longest operational theaters in the United States. It's Wednesday, March 29th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Aaron, Susan, thanks so much for being a part of the show today. Uh, I'm wondering how this all came to be. So, Susan, I know you moved here two and a half years ago from Austin. And in that short period, now you're a co-owner of one of Portland's oldest theaters. How did that come about? Oh, well, I I made a deal with a crossroads demon and all of my wishes came true. And that crossroads demon looked like Aaron. Uh, No, uh, (laughs) the short of it is I moved to Portland because I love the Pacific Northwest. And I love that this is the only place in the world that has fully operating century old theaters, like multiples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote in uh, to volunteer to the Clinton after going once, seeing a weird program. And I was like, who booked this? This is great. But who booked this? And it turns out it was Aaron who was working with the old owners at the time. And um, he went ahead and hired me. (laughs) That's great. And Aaron, I know you've been in the scene for like over a decade. Our paths have crossed a few times. uh, You used to run Banana Stand Media. And I think a lot of Portlanders who back in the day will recognize that you documented a lot of the local punk scene and have been. So it's interesting. Like, tell me about your jump to running a theater. (laughs) Uh, strangely enough, about a decade ago, myself and one of the other owners, Tom Kishel, um, saw that the theater was up for sale, um, but we didn't have the money to buy it at the time. And when the pandemic was really raging and um, everything was shut down, Lonnie Joe, the former owner, sent out one of her famous email newsletters. And at the end of it, she you know, admitted that things were just really tough. Um, and so I became kind of a, a volunteer over there, helping program a bunch of stuff and finally assembled a team of great people like Susan to buy it. And we took over operations April 1st, 2022. What I find really interesting is how the Clinton Theater throughout this, it's almost like the Lloyd Center in a way where every (laughs) few months, you know, like every year they're just like, oh, is the Clinton Theater going to close, you know, and then something always saves it. And I just want to know, like, what is it about the Clinton Theater that made you, Aaron, and you, Susan, just be like, let's let's buy this theater. Let's save it once again and try to do something different. Like, tell me what the appeal is. Um, the Clinton is special just in its its longevity, its, you know, checkered past. And, and the fact that the only way that people would keep saving it is because they are genuinely interested in helping it thrive um, in the community. Because it's never mm-hmm. going to be like, a, you know, we're not getting Lamborghinis or anything, but everyone's invested because they they care about the space being not only for film, but for, you know, drag, comedy, music events, even video art, visual art, things like that, that we can use the space for in the community. I think we've joked about it being like the the neighborhood garage space where, you know, there's a shared calendar in a way and we all want time on it. So you just have to like figure out when we might be able to fit you in. Susan oftentimes comes up with like a genre or a theme for the month. And then, you know, list 50 movies and then we have to pare it down to what can we actually get the rights to? What can we afford? Like, what do we think people are going to show out to? And sometimes we pick things that we know people aren't going to come out to, but we show them anyway because we like them. So, I mean, you just uh, said, yeah, you know, you and Susan talk about programming. I feel like two people talking about programming, quick convo, but there are like six other people that own this theater. But this isn't the first time the Clinton Street Theater has been owned collectively, right? Do you guys know anything about that? Not enough. We're trying to get in touch um, with some of the people or maybe their next of kin who were part of that collective in the 70s. We think the iconic sign, that kind of red wrought iron that is put up above the marquee is from that time. So you don't know like what they were showing or what they were doing? I mean, they weren't part of the you know, quote unquote, adult films that were actually just European films that showed women's breasts? 
<laughs> they were kind of the resurrectors, bringing in Rocky as like a continuous lifeblood that's been wonderful uh, for the theater. And then they also were bringing in art house films, things that were cult films before they were cult films. So essentially, every decade or so, the Clinton Theater changes what it offers the community, but it always is part of the community. So under this new ownership, what has changed? I think we've done a lot more diverse types of events, more music, um, certainly a lot more drag. A lot of that is due to a former employee, Violet Hex, who has helped really make the theater a great place for drag. Uh, Muriel Lucas, who works at the theater, who does Church of Film every Wednesdays, um, you know, that's been expanded, mm -hmm. probably the best film series in the United States, at least. In your humble opinion. <laughs> He's yeah, 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 yeah. It's just terrific. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about tell me about that series. Sell it. Um, so Muriel is an actual genius. I think she's a former <laughs> Latin professor who also happens to speak several other languages, and she finds films from around the world that you've never heard of that have kind of been lost to time, and she will often do her own captions, her own English language captions, because they were never properly wow. translated. So Church of Film every Wednesday, you'll probably not know what the film is, but you're going to love what you see. Could you give some examples of some films that have aired that, whose cat is that? Because that, that cat needs love or food no, he's, or He's 19 pet. years old, so he, he just is upset that he's still mm. alive. He's a beautiful <laughs> goblin. <laughs> he's so cute. Uh, so Church of Film on Wednesdays, give me some examples of something that you guys were just like, that was awesome. Um, earlier this month, there was a collection of Ukrainian animation um, that kind of spanned the 70s, um, 80s, and 90s. And it's just a wonderful collection of, again, Ukrainian animation that I wouldn't have known about and wouldn't have seen if it wasn't for Church of Film. So why should people care about the Clinton Street Theater? Having that space available, like a DIY space where people can show their art, um, especially local art, is so rare, especially for me coming from Austin. And the fact that it's existed for so long through just the passion of the people that have run it. It's an incredible resource for that block, for that neighborhood, and I think for all of Portland. And as far as Rocky goes, seeing the pure enthusiasm of like a queer teen that gets to come out and be themselves for the, maybe the first time at a Rocky screening is, is an absolute joy, like even 44 years later. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a quick break here. When we come back, let's dive into the history of the Clinton Street Theater because I heard it's got a bit of a checkered past. Based on the true story that shocked the world. I am. Critics are calling A Spy Among Friends on MGM Plus a thrilling new Cold War drama. Treason. That's what I'm accusing you of. With spellbinding performances. I am not a traitor! Starring Emmy Award winners Damian Lewis and Guy Pearce. You're trying to get me killed. Give me one reason why not. I love some. A Spy Among Friends. Watch now only on MGM Plus. I feel like the Clinton Theater has been part of a lot of Portlanders' lives, even if they don't go, just because it's existed for so long. But a lot of people just see it as, oh, this is the place where I can see the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I feel like that has been what people mostly know about the Clinton Theater. But I mean, it's had this long, long history. You know, it's over 100 years old. Um, for those who don't know much of its history, could either of you briefly share a bit about it up until now? Um, so. Best we can tell, the building got started with construction in about 1913. We think it was open sometime in 1915 in the spring. Movie theaters were big business um, along the West Coast and especially in Portland. So it operated through a variety of different owners up until I think the 60s. And then it became part of a local family's empire of uh, adult movie theaters and they oh so i had like a little cd past yeah a little CD, the cdiest uh, yeah the cdiest okay but cool. also some of the All films right. that they were showing were actually just like european art films that happened to have nudity or adult situations and so hundreds and hundreds of people gotcha. would line up to see 
films like I Am Curious Yellow, which is really just like a Marxist screed about um, modern society, um, but it happens to have some nudity in it. And so American audiences were tricked into to coming and watching it. Um, after that, in the 70s, it was turned over to a collective that kind of, I think, embodies the spirit that it still has today. And in 1978 is when the Rocky Horror Picture Show started to play every week and has since then. I think we're the longest running weekly Rocky Horror Picture Show in the mm -hmm. world. I found it really impressive that even through the pandemic, somebody would go into the theater and play it to an empty theater just just to keep that title. Aaron, was that you? Were you the one who was going in? Like who was going in and, and playing Rocky Horror to an empty theater just to keep that title of like longest running showing? That wasn't me. No, um, there was someone who used to work at the theater who would come in and do it. And I think the old owners, um, Lonnie, Joe and Roger also kind of kept that spirit alive. Technicality, but we'll take it, right? So Aaron and Susan, could you tell me what's coming up in April for the uh, Clinton Theater? Like what a newbie might be interested in coming and checking out? For the April program, we're doing half happy birthday John Waters. It's his birthday month and he'll be at the Aladdin for his birthday. But we're programming some of his movies and we're decorating the entire lobby to kind of honor our cinema daddy, John Waters. And then the other half of the program to pair with John Waters, I thought we'd do something kind of fun and sleazy. So we're doing a film noir program called Night Sweats. And mm. it's going to be uh, everything from like classic noirs, like Detour, which is one of the first noirs where Anne Savage is like an absolute beast and you gotta watch it. Um, you know, my cult has a passport, the samurai, uh, some Jess Franco in there to kind of call back to that old sleaze of the theater, Jess Franco's Black Boots Leather Whip, which is kind of a neo-noir. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it would be a good starter education if you wanted to kind of dabble into your, your film noir canon. Or your John Waters. We're showing some of his earlier stuff, too, or some of his, like, less shown, like the underdogs, like Cecil B. Demented and Multiple Maniacs. Yeah, that's so cool. Are you guys doing anything for your birthday, for your uh, one-year anniversary collective? You know, ownership? we're not, really. Um, we probably should you have. You guys should. April, and it's what, on, on April Fool's Day? I know. Well... Um, if you're listening to this and it's April Fool's Day, maybe swing by in the morning and check out our marquee. You might see that we're potentially screening the greatest mafia film of all time. But that night we're hosting a comedy, like a stand-up special with some of Portland's best comedians. So we're always busy. Don't have enough time to celebrate ourselves. Oh, uh, you should celebrate yourselves. You guys are doing a great job. But I love that even on your birthday, you're just like, I'm just going to throw somebody else a party. That is so sweet. Well... I'm really excited that you guys are potentially going to have an appearance from John Waters. I'm, we're manifesting. It's going to happen. How is he not going to show up? He's in town. It's his birthday. Who knows? You're doing He's a whole very busy. show about him. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Is he that busy, though? I'll just put a little trailer of like Cookie Mueller biographies with a stick in a box. <laughs> <laughs> See if it gets him. <laughs> just, uh, just like, you know, kitsch paraphernalia of the manson family just a rubber away. hot dog yeah. yeah also i think he has a thing for portland he's always here and the fact that he's spending his birthday here i don't know well thank you too you guys are amazing seriously continue <laughs> the awesome work i'm really excited to see what you guys keep doing you know uh, and do next so thank you thank you for coming on the show thanks for having us see you at the theater claudia see you at the theater so <laughs> And now for your microdose of news. In the past few weeks, there have been at least three high-profile fires at camps where unhoused Portlanders are living. There was the one under the Interstate Avenue overpass, uh, the one in a quasi-tunnel under the steel bridge, and a tent fire under the Broadway Bridge. Last year, Portland firefighters responded to 2,000 fires that were related to unhoused residents. Now that's 41% of all fires in the city. The president of the Portland Firefighters Association told Coin6, The long-term solution is not camping as we see now, people living in tents and people living on the streets in this way. It's not safe. And did you know you need a permit if you want to eat roadkill? Uh, it came from a bill that passed back in 2017 to prevent people from hitting buck for their antlers. 
But the state is now seeing less demand for these roadkill salvage permits. And uh, Oregon Fish and Wildlife officials are puzzled by this decline in the last two years. Some theories they've concocted include maybe Oregonians lost their appetite for roadkill, or maybe people have just gone better at identifying what's edible and what isn't. I don't know. I wonder what it could be. Any theories of your own? Send them over to Portland at citycast.fm. Why are we not demanding more roadkill permits? For even more local news and events, sign up for our daily newsletter, Hey Portland. We'll throw a link in the show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate it, or leave us a good review? We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. <laughs>